agrarian protest. We are fortunate to have with us today two artists with long lifetimes devoted not only to writing, but to the problems and politics of life in the Midwest. We have Mr. James Hurst, primarily known for his poetry from Iowa, and Miradelle Lesseur, primarily known for her short fiction from Minnesota, though let me hasten to say that both of these people have written in many other kinds of forms and have done many, many interesting and different things with their lives. I would like our format today to be a little different from the other sessions. I have asked each one of our artists to read a little bit from their work. And then after that, I'll try to kick things off with a, a question or two. And although I know this physical arrangement is very intimidating, I've been on both sides of the microphone now, and it's not any easier, I think, up there on the steps <laughs> than it is down here. But nevertheless, I'd like to open this up as much as possible into a kind of conversation with Maradella Sore and James Hurst. I know that there are many of you out there who have read their works and are very interested to talk with them. And I'm, I know that your questions will bring up things that I perhaps couldn't have thought of myself. And so I hope that as soon as uh, I get this thing going a little bit with a question or two, that you will have questions and that we can try to break down the formality of this microphone situation. I know this audience is full of people who are not a bit shy. Uh, and if, if we're all going to be intimidated by a microphone, I think we might as well give up because I think there's everybody in this room except maybe that baby can knock down these microphones if you need to. So let's try to do that, knock them down either physically or knock them down at least as some kind of psychological barrier to us. I would also like to acknowledge that Don West, who many of you, perhaps all of you heard in the presentation just before this one, was originally in the early planning going to be on this session, and I certainly know of no one who has better right to be on a session called Art and Agrarian Protest. But in ma as a matter of fact, uh, Mr. West has so many facets to his activities that they pulled him off my session and they put him somewhere else. And that upset me a little bit, but nevertheless, we did have a chance to hear him. And I hope if he's in the audience, I'm not spotting him right now, but maybe he will be in the audience by the time that we can talk together, that he, he will feel, feel free to enter into the discussions on art and agrarian protest. I'd like to begin by introducing James Hurst, James Hurst is an Iowa farmer, a poet, and a teacher, all from Cedar Falls. He is now Professor Emeritus also from the University of Northern Iowa. He began his writing with a new earnestness, not the childhood writing, but he began with a new earnestness during a long hospital stay. And I think he's been publishing poetry at least since 1937 and has many, many collections of poetry published since that time and almost a countless number in individual periodicals. This book, Snake and the Strawberries, is a selection, not a collection, a selection of poems that were written over the period 1937 to 1978. This book is published by Iowa State University Press, 1979, and it is available in the lobby in one of the tables out there. In 1974, the North American Review featured him in a special edition. Hearst credits the Irish poet and dramatist John Singh as being most influential in teaching him that, quote, there is no poetry that does not have strong roots among the worms and clay. Like many others in these sessions, Hearst's work has extended into the directly political, particularly through his association with Henry Wallace. He has contributed articles to Wallace's Farmer and a series of articles on Henry Wallace to Nation Magazine. By way of a bit of an introduction, I wanted to read just a few sentences out of the preface of his book. He writes, I was born and raised on a farm and worked on the family farm the first part of my life. The need for expression seemed never quite satisfied by the work in barn and field. So I tried in my spare time to translate farm life into poetry. I did not think of myself as a poet, but rather as a man who attempts to make poems. I had the farmer's calloused hands, wished for a perceptive mind, and hoped for a loving heart. Mr. Hurst. I don't think many of you are old enough to know what I'm going to talk about. 
And I'm going to talk about the Depression in 1930. I'm going to read you a little piece from an article that I wrote called Drought in the Depression. It was published in the Palimpsest, the magazine for the, published by the Iowa Historical Association. Depressed prices for farm products existed years before the stock market break. Most city folk did not realize that since the end of World War I, farmers had been ground between the millstones of high overhead and low prices. Many farmers blamed Herbert Hoover for pulling the rug out from under them when he withdrew support for the prices he had guaranteed. When the war was over, Hoover had no longer need for hogs, corn, butter, eggs, sugar, to feed the troops and our allies. And so prices fell and they fell and they stayed low all during the 20s. By 1930, our family reached out all of its hands to stay alive. We knew we had the muscle and we proved it. My father took a job with the Farm Bureau. He was president of the Iowa Farm Bureau for 13 years and his paycheck helped balance the bank balance. And my sister Louise taught school and her check when she got one during the depression School teachers were not paid uh, regularly. They went to the same place. And mother made cottage cheese and, and sold eggs to a little restaurant in town. And my brother Charles ran the farm and tried to keep the machinery going and fade the pigs and keep the hired men paid. Farm families suffered during the Depression in a way that was different from people in town. When a factory worker man lost his job and his paycheck, he knew where he stood, probably in the bread line. A banker knew where he stood, too, when he bank closed his doors and he was unable to meet his obligations. He jumped out of a 10-story window or shot himself or went home and shriveled up into a sick old man. But on the farm, the situation was different. It was not quite so clear. Farmers knew about debt. Most farms had a mortgage on them. Machines were not paid for. Livestock was bought on loans. In normal times, these obligations were paid off with money from the sale of crops and livestock. Now, with such low prices, the money failed to appear. We ate what we produced. We never went hungry. But the effort to hold together all the things that he had worked for sometimes marked the man for life. One day, Chuck and I received a phone call from a man who had once worked for us. He was working on the John Deere factory in Waterloo, and John Deere paid better wages than the farmer paid. But now he felt the abrasive touch of unemployment. Come and get me, he said over the phone. I'll work for just my food. I ain't gonna go on relief. Already our two hired men were working for slim enough wages. They each had a house to live in and food to eat. And Chuck said, what will we do? We haven't worked for enough for another man. But we cranked up our Model T Ford and drove her to Waterloo. And I will never forget the sight of those empty parking lots, the taverns closed, the factory dirty and silent, no smoke from the forges, no hurrying men, no railroad cars shuttling in the yards, no clatter of machines, nothing but the emptiness and a stale, brassy smell of poverty. We found Herman standing in the line in front of the Salvation Army headquarters. I knew you'd come, he said, but I thought I'd get me a bowl of soup. We took him home and fed him, turned him over to Mother. She needed help in the garden, trash removed, spading done, lawn mowed. Do you want to stay with us, she said. No, he said, I'll walk. It ain't but four miles, and I'll come every day. Why, Mrs. Hurst, I don't know when I've had a piece of meat. What about your wife and children, Mother asked. My wife, she works at a little cafe, and she eats there, and the kids get a free meal at school, and she brings home scraps for their supper. And that's the way it was. Herman walked back and forth morning and night, four miles each way. Mother's cooking filled out the hollows in his cheeks, and the soon, sun soon changed his factory pallor, and we had plenty for him to do. On a farm, work has a habit of appearing whenever there's a spare hand pair of hands to do it. He kept the lawn mowed, the garden weeded, chicken house repaired, chopped down a couple of dead trees, shored up the window panes with putty, put hinges on the sagging barn doors, reshingled the shed where a limb had fallen on it, and when summer came he worked in the field baling hay and loading the hail, 
hay bales and shoveling off the oats from the combine. Late when fall came, my brother found him a job with a, with a machinery dealer in town, and he only had to walk four blocks instead of four miles. When President Roosevelt did not lead the, perhaps President Roosevelt did not lead the country into the promised land, but he sure pulled the economy out of its rut and dusted it off and make it begin to run again. The terrible days of the Depression put a mark on families that were never to be erased. People, good, hard-working people, found themselves penniless. Their entire savings had disappeared like smoke. Farmers were begging for jobs as janitors in schools, churches, night watchmen in factories. One day I heard on the radio that one of our neighbors had gone out in the field with a shotgun and killed himself so his children and wife could have his insurance. The mortgage on his farm had been foreclosed and he had no place to go. What's the good of foreclosing a mortgage, Mother asked. The bank or insurance company can't sell a farm, can't even rent it. Well, that's the way things done, my brother has said. It's an old custom, when you get a man down, kick him. <laughs> the farm holiday movement spread like an epidemic. When a farm was foreclosed and the farmer's goods and livestock sold at auction, the neighbors made it a penny sale. Everything the auctioneer offered for sale brought one cent. When the sale ended, the livestock, grain, machinery, and household goods were returned to the owner for pennies. And one look at the hard, determined faces of the men who surrounded the auctioneer discouraged any outsider from raising that bid. In western Iowa, a judge tried to stop a sale with a legal writ, and he found a rope around his neck on the other end over a limb of a tree, and plenty of men ready to pull it. Creameries were picketed, cans of milk and cream were dumped, butter destroyed, violence born of desperation in an attempt to call attention to the farmer's troubles. One July morning, I drove two miles north to the Benson Creamery to see with my own eyes what was going on. At about a half a mile from the creamery, a truck slowly moved across the road and blocked me, and two men with rifles got out. And I was shocked to see old Elmer Clausen and Jake Muller and I said, what the hell do you guys think you're doing? And old Einer looked me right in the eye and he said, you ain't going any farther, Jim. No one but us members can go down to the creamy. What are you doing over here anyway? You boys don't milk. And I said, I just came over to see what we heard, what we heard was true. If you heard we was dumping milk and cream, you heard right. <clears throat> right now that creamery is a dead horse. I shook my head and I said, you Einer and you Jake with guns for God's sake. Are you really dumping the trucks? He said, you damn right. You just look down that road and see that big new truck upside down the ditch. You think the ferries did that? <laughs> the truck lay on its side and you could smell the milky suds that filled the ditch. And I looked down the road past the creamery and there was another group of men with guns. And I said, you really think this kind of monkey business will raise prices? And Einer said, we can sure raise hell and maybe some of those big bugs will get it through their thick heads that we're hurting out here. I thought about it, and I said, I suppose the papers and the, will send for reporters and photographers out here. You bet, Jake said, and more are coming. Now, Jim, you get out of here before you get into trouble. Is there any business of yours and it's no skin off your nose? It seemed kind of ridiculous, but I didn't want to laugh. I said, go to hell, Jake. You going to shoot me? These men were my neighbors. And for the first time, Jake grinned. I might have to, he said, if you get fractious. Well, I said, I'm all for you, this will help. Listen, boy, Jake said, you go out and get you 40 cows to milk night and morning, seven days of the week, and find the milk ain't even worth the feed, and you can get damn tired of pulling tits. I shifted in reverse. Okay, I said, I guess I'm in the wrong pew. The farmer's holiday movement did startle the papers into headlines, even the state New York Times, and the farmer's predicament began to haunt the publishing, the Congress, it helped elect Franklin Roosevelt. When I drove in the yard, Chuck said, are they really doing it? And I said, they're doing it. They mean business too. They're crazy as coots, Chuck said. That may be, but our friend Elmer and Jake are on patrol with guns and they aren't kidding. Mother asked, do you suppose they'll call off the National Guard? And Chuck said, probably some jackass will blast away and kill somebody. And then they'll run for cover. I said, no, I don't think so, not these boys. They aim to stay until the whole affair gets national prominence. They're at, that's what they're after. They know that dumping a few 
trucks of cream isn't going to raise prices. They give you a bad time? They thought I was nosy. We aren't dairymen, and they made a point of it. Mother said you should have told them what you boys got for the last load of hogs you shipped to Chicago. After freight, commission, and trucking, just about enough to wire a shotgun, Chuck said. I never thought of it, I said. I doubt if they'd listen. They're all hepped up about the dairy situation. Chuck poured some cream on a shortcake. Those bastards in Washington can't seem to get the sleep out of their eyes. And Mother said, we've been through this before. And I didn't need to be reminded, a little over 10 years ago, just after World War I, farm prices took a nosedive while the city folk hooped it up on the stock market. Even our own banker said, if farmers would just stay home and tend to their business and stop complaining, they'd be all right. And our memories ran back over the years. Grandfather came to Iowa in, 19, in 1859, and he bought a farm, and the whole family, uncles, aunts, father, were born and raised on that farm, and we were too. And farmer, father bought out his sisters and brothers, but he still owed for some of the, of the shares. Late in May, when the corn was planted, the oats up, pastures not yet uh, pastured, the tax, taxes had not been paid for over a year. And how could they be paid? There was no money. My second brother, Robert, the second son, who once stood t six feet tall and weighed 200 pounds and was a star tackle on the football team, was now slowly dying of cancer. And all those trips to the university hospitals, all those radiation treatments, all that medicine cost money. And there Bob sat like a ghost of himself, slowly wasting away. Never a word of despair, never complaint, Never any signs of anguish so often seen in people when they ask, why does it have to be me? He still drove the truck to the gasoline that needs to the tractor, and he still drove the car to take mother to town. He tried to mow the lawn and he helped with the garden, but we all felt something dying in us while we watched him die. I was just home from a two year stay in the hospital after a bad accident. At the end of the college year, we had a fraternity party up the river and I drove off a boat dock into shallow water. Two years in the hospital. You can imagine the money it took to pay the hospital and doctor bills. How could a farmer already in debt for his farm stand so much expense? The war was over. There was no longer that slogan, food will win the war. One son dying and one on crutches. How could father and mother rally from a crushing blow like that? It must have hurt my father to walk into a bank and know that he couldn't borrow any money when he already owed so much. Because during World, World War I, the government had urged all of us farmers to plop every acre we could find and raise all the hogs we could, and they guaranteed the prices. And when the war ended, the government forgot about the prices. And the huge food factory they had started no longer had any buyers for its products. Fertile Iowa land went begging. Nobody would buy it. In the city, people bought stocks on the fever stock exchange. And they all hoped to get rich. But a family is not always crushed under the weight of misfortune. The family ties grow stronger, ties of courage and strength. Louise and Charles assumed duties they knew they must be carried out, no matter how young and untested they were. The family did not sink into the quicksands of despair. Louise brought her friends home and they filled the house with music and talk, jazz, cheese and rye on bread, spiked near beer. Chuck dropped out of college to run the farm and help his two invalid brothers. The family life pulled itself up by its footsteps. But one day in 1921, we received a notice that the sheriff had served papers on us for the non-payment of taxes and offer part of the farm for sale. This seemed a humiliation that father and mother need not suffer. And on that day, the sheriff was to come. My uncle George took time off from his busy medical practice to take them out to lunch. The sheriff agreed to come while they were gone and we three brothers offered to act as a committee for the sheriff. The next day, the weather seemed ordinary. Neither the cattle nor the hogs behaved in an unusual way. The leaves moved in a light wind. The windmill wheel turned slowly. The sun shone with the same light that it gave to the battle of the Somme in Gettysburg. Peas and carrots in the garden grew in a straighter, crooked row in which they were planted. But it was a portentous wake day for us, and we three brothers sat at the dining room table and ate our lunch. The dog barked as the car drove into the yard. A tall, lean man without a hat stepped out and picked up a briefcase and walked briskly to the front door. Chuck opened it. I'm Cap Wagner, the sheriff, he said. 
This is not my idea of a good time, but I wish you young men would listen while I read the summons to you. He opened his briefcase and took out a paper and put on a pair of spectacles with silver rims, and in a dull, low voice, he read the summons. He folded the papers, put them back in the envelope, and talked up the center of the table. Okay, he said, that's it. Give the papers to your dad when he comes back. He went over to Bob and put his arm around Bob's shoulder. How are you getting along, young man, he said. I know you're having a tough time, and I admire your guts. And Bob's voice trembled. Will the farm really be sold? The sheriff shook his head. You have a year to redeem it. Don't worry, Bob. Your dad will get the taxes paid. It's just that the law says we have to do it this way. It was a day that burned in our memories. To lose part of the farm would be more than the family could have to bear. The farm was home. It was part of our life and part of our flesh and blood. I remember when a man we knew who lived in town called up Father and asked him if he was going to pay the taxes or would the ADV for sale. And we young folks took an instant delight to that poor old man, and we always treated him coldly. Years later, when Bob was gone and the anxiety and grief had dulled, and the family thought of this as a low point in our lives. Eventually, the taxes were paid, the land redeemed. We just dug in and faced what had to be faced and survived. But no one who ever weathered the Depression escaped with a kind of a obsession for security. A couple of good crop years, and we were on the way up. We discovered that working together had made all the difference as we faced illness, death, and felt the abrasive touch of despair. It was working together that kept us going. President Roosevelt once said, there is nothing to fear but fear itself. Now that may have been just a political ploy, but after he said it, there was hope. And one morning, a couple of years after the worst of the Depression, I was out on the tractor disking in the oats in a field along the road, and Einar Clausen drove by with his milk truck, and we waved to each other the way neighbors do. I want to read you. I'd like to read you three, three poems that I wrote about this time that were I say, depression poems. This one is written about the farm hand, the tenant farmer, the sharecropper, the man who never owns anything. And it's called The Same in This as Other Lands. He bows his head against the wind that dries the muscles of his hands, that thrills the poor and needy folk, the same in this as other lands. Mud in the litter on his boots, witness the chores that he has done. Think of the stables he has cleaned and never owned a part of one. His helpless eyes watch time unfold, vague leaves of promise everywhere that are not written in his tongue, though he is often mentioned there. The same in this as other lands, he grinds his labor for our bread, working the daily miracle by which the multitude is fed. And this one was written after our visit over to the Waterloo to John Deere factory. It's called On Relief. Our glances met as glances meet and sharp as salt was my surprise. I saw as I went down the street a man with want ads in his eyes. For sale he offered to my sight, without the usual signboard's flash, a man bewilderment and fright can mark down cheap when prices crash. The factory quiet as a rock, and all around the heavy smell of men locked out as surplus stock. His eyes, like posters, told it well. And though his gestures still were staunch, with every glance his eyes returned, a man with no more ships to launch, with no more bridges to be burned. And then this last one I wrote is a kind of a poem of, of penance, because we farmers did furnish food for the war to help kill people. And so I felt we had a need for our penance war are doing that, and it's called Invocation. Come, you farmers, let us sing together. Let us sing at the, at the, let us sing of the passion for planting. We, the sowers and the growers, live for the shoot 
and the spread root. Let us sing a song of penance for the ageless passion for crosses staining the thick pages of history. For we the peace lovers fed and clothed the armies. For we the home lovers milled like cows at the crossroad. Let us sing low and sadly now for the belly's not fed and the bare bed for the rotten cotton and the moldy wheat piled unfit to eat. Let a Judas tree be found in every farmyard to drip its bloody bloom at, at Easter time. Come, you farmers, Easter is the time of the marriage of the sun with the earth. But a Judas tree in every garden, all you land lovers who lie down at night on a bed spiked with mortgages. You crazy farmers who trade a whole generation for a piece of ground. Come and let us sing together under our Judas trees. We have the strong hands and the deep voices. We, the lovers of our farms. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurst. I know from your letter it wasn't enormously convenient for you to be here today, but I know that we're all very, very glad that you were. Now I'd like to introduce Miradel Lassour. Miradel Lassour was born 80 years ago to a mother, Marion Lassour, who was herself an activist. Miradel's stepfather, Arthur Lassour, was a socialist mayor of Minot, North Dakota. She moved to Minnesota in 1915 and still resides in St. Paul. She published her first short story, I believe, in 1927. And through the 1940s, Miradel Hosur published short stories and what I would call essays and poetic reporting. The style is so much more beautiful, I hate to call it just reporting. Uh, in such journals as New Masses, American Mercury, Scribner's, Nation, Partisan Review, Daily Worker. But during the McCarthy era, Miradel Lassour was blacklisted. Her extraordinary collection of short stories, Salute to Spring, this book, which had been published in 1940, was allowed to go out of print. It's only really with the women's movement in the early 1970s that her work was found again, found this time by a new generation of women hungry to read of ourselves, of our mothers and our grandmothers, of our lives in an American society that oppresses systematically on the basis of race, creed, and sex. What did Miradel Lassour write about that was so seditious that she had to be blacklisted? She wrote about the poor. She wrote about people on strike. She wrote about women, women who are unemployed, are locked up, are sexually alive, are starving to death. She wrote, as she says, about the blackness, weight, and terror of childhood in mid-America. And the mentality of the Chamber of Commerce, I think, in Kansas has never yet forgiven her. She wrote about Sacco and Vanzetti. And she wrote with honesty, with accuracy, and compassion. And she wrote also with that great gift of the artist gift for the use of language. Her prose is exquisite in its emotional delicacy and poetic in its condensed and original expression. Her work is becoming available again. I'd like to show you a few things. I don't have all of them by any means. But these are a few things. Uh, a novel, The Girl, Song for My Time, Harvest, and Women on the Bread Lines are all collections of many of these essays and short stories that until fairly recently have been buried in the original magazines uh, where they were first published. Um, I know that these books and I think several others are now on sale in the lobby and so maybe you can stop there and, and see them. She told me yesterday she was a Lazarus and I thought of the Eliot line in the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all. So I'd like to now introduce Miradel Lassour. We now appear as ancestors, I guess, at this meeting, and we see the wonderful faces of the men and women, of the people's struggles, of the past, 
and the new people, the new historians. It's a wonderful moment to me to see history now revived in that time span between the old and the new and getting energy and strength from each other. Recently we have had on, the, on the Minneapolis TV some of our illustrious writers, Eric Severide and Harrison Salisbury, and I couldn't help but compare the great faces that I've seen here uh, with those dead men who were apologizing for their lives of prostitution. I think it's great for the young people just to uh, look at some of the speakers here, at some of the great leaders of the people who have never lost their faith in the people, who have never given in to the terrors and to the terribleness of our century, which has been the most bloody century in, ever in the world, I believe, and who stand out against all the philosophy of the middle class, of the academy, of the universities, the philosophy of T.S. Eliot and the hollow men and the straw men and existentialism and uh, alienation, all of these terrible diseases, I think they, they have influenced decades of our young people and our danger, and you see now how dangerous they are, how cover, what cover-ups they are for plain murder for plain massacre, for plain destruction of the people of the world. I have a, I've been asked by the young people, how did you ally yourself with the people? In fact, one interviewer said, you could have made a lot of money. You could have been a famous writer. You could have been well known. Uh, uh, these words were very strange to me because it never occurred to me to be any of those things. And I had to look back to see why. I was so, uh, so rooted in, uh, in my feeling of belonging to the American people, why all the discouragements, the wars, the depressions, the failures you might, uh, that they are called in the middle class of people's movements, uh, all of these things, what does give you the root and the courage and the vitality to appear here, as many of these wonderful men and women are appearing, without cynicism, without death, without the shadow of the corpse, without the terrors of atomic suicide, who appear here as speakers, as living presences, I would say, of the strength of the people's democratic movements in America. And you young people uh, are looking to see what there is what you can believe in. There's been some expression of disbelief, of pessimism, of cynicism. But if I'm a witness here today, I want to say that my witness is that this is the most wonderful period that I've ever lived in because of the visibility and the uh, wonderful uh, uh, communication of the peoples of the world. In my youth, we never heard of the third world. This was not in our consciousness. We never knew the struggles of guerrillas, armies in, in Nicaragua. I mean, we, we lived in, our, uh, in the struggles of our small places and did the, did the best we could to penetrate the lies and the, uh, the, the terrible, now we see a conspiracy to keep from us the true history of our people, the true history of American democracy, the true great struggle of our people against monopoly uh, that, that uh, I was part of in the beginning of the century. And, and this, this um, uh, pollution of, of history, and I also call it the pollution of language. I mean, the language itself is, is befouled, is polluted. You can listen to those great white murderers in the White House, and you really can't tell what they mean or what they say. The, the, the language itself, you can even die in the wrong language. I mean, you will be dying in the wrong language if you go to the Persian to see to, to defend oil. You'll be dying in the wrong language. Well, I, I lived through the First World War, which was a great trauma to me, a great injury to my whole, every young man that I knew never came back from Europe. And I was 18 years old, and this was, I realized now, was a great injury to my whole psyche, to my whole being and to the being of, of my country. Uh, Clarence told us the words of Woodrow Wilson, 
There, we died in the wrong language. And Woodrow Wilson gave us this great idealistic, this tremendous language of democracy, this great language of idealism, of Americanism, and so on. And we found in, in eight months, he voted for us into this, this bloody war. So I right then became uh, suspicious of the language. I was a socialist when I was 12, so that helped. Um, it, <laughs> I think culturally I was most uh, affected by the IWW, who had, I think, the most cultural uh, feeling or, or movement in their movement. In fact, they didn't think that a poet could be a poet unless he was a worker. They weren't far wrong. But they had, and if you were a worker, you were a poet. And the IWW movement had, had, uh, had great poetry. They never had a meeting that they didn't, uh, somebody didn't open it with, a, with poetry or singing. Uh, I, I first heard um, Joe Hill in, in the park in, in St. Paul singing about the strike on the range. And that's the first time I, I thought, saw you could sing in a park. <laughs> and, uh, but I remember that all the movements that I was in since I was five or six, there was always singing and always poetry and always uh, a feeling of the culture of the people. I was glad that the two young historians on the Nonpartisan League spoke of the culture of the League, which this was, this was also true. They, they spoke of Bear, who was one of the great cartoonists. I wish somebody would make an anthology of his, his work. And the picnics, the picnics were the, the great uh, uh, Greek meetings of the people. And there was great culture, great singing, original songs and poetry, and oratory. Oratory was a great cultural thing. It was a, a Debs. We didn't have anything like these things. I mean, you had to involve your lungs and your diaphragm and your belly. You couldn't just talk into these mechanics. And Debs was a frail man, but I still, and I think thousands of people remember his great speeches. I've interviewed people, old men on the coast who wept, remembering Debs' speeches and remembering even what he said. But this was, a, this was the, their great culture of the oratory of this man in, in their behalf speaking of their sufferings, of their misery, of their life, and that's what culture is. So uh, I, I remember the schools that we had, the moonlight schools in Oklahoma, I went to when I was 14 or 15. And then it was started the People's College in Fort Scott, Kansas in 1915. And Debs, Debs and the Socialist Party, Helen Keller was on the board, Stein Metz, uh, and this was a people's school, and you may not believe it, they had people, uh, workers, English. I put this in an essay that I wrote for the University of Minnesota, and the, the editor said, there's no such thing as workers, English. <laughs> and, and my mother wrote a book uh, on workers, English, as different from bourgeois English. <laughs> and now we, I think we can see that this is really a, a, a point. And uh, we had tremendous meetings when Helen Keller came and Steinman had tremendous picnics, tremendous meetings, tremendous. They're asking what, what were the women doing in, uh, in the Nonpartisan League? Well, women's roles in, in the Nonpartisan League in many are much like the Native American women who were the backbone, who were the instigators of Wounded Knee. I mean, they said to the men, are we going to let the stock exchange in Minneapolis ruin us? Are we going to starve? Are we going to flee our farms? Aren't, aren't you, are you men or are you mice? Are you going to do something? I mean, this was in the households. Of, and don't think, they said that masses of people came to these picnics. Who in hell fed them? It wasn't Jesus. And it was, uh, it was, uh, it was women with political chicken and political potato salad. <laughs> And, and this was not a, 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 a denigrated function of women to feed people either, I think, in the, farm, in the farm culture. That can be gone into by the women's movement. I think it should be. My mother, when I was 12 years old, had to kidnap her children from Texas because in Texas in 1912, we were property of the, of the male. 
the, the, the wife and the children were actual property. And she had to kidnap, kidnap us up in the, in the middle of the night and take us over the border, it was called, into Oklahoma, which had just become a state and had some very, very liberal laws about women and children. And uh, I think, as a matter of fact, women could vote for about one year there in, in Oklahoma. Uh, so, so we had to hide because we were chattel slaves, really. And my mother said she was worse off than a, ch than a, than a, a, a black slave because nobody would pay a cent for her. I mean, she couldn't even uh, sell herself as a slave. A good breeding woman was worth $1,200, perhaps. But, so um, then I had to go into court and choose uh, whether I should go with my brothers to my father or my mother. And the judge told me uh, I didn't have any question. I was going with those great matriarchs who fed you. Uh, I had no, no, no thing about going with my father. So he told me that my mother would never make a living, and beside that, she was a whore, which I thought was a ma some praise or something he was giving her. <laughs> So I it went with these matriarchs. And I think that this is another area of, of, of women historians, that um, the women in the Middle West had a matriarchal society because of the economy. Men had to leave our village every uh, winter to go to find, to get a, a wage. They went to the timber, they went to the mines. And the village was very often just, just the matriarchal women there who took care of the children, who saw that nobody starved, who uh, my, my grandmother went through Oklahoma w in a horse and buggy and a shotgun to get men to stop drinking. I don't think she succeeded, but um, or, or I never heard of her shooting any drunks, but, <laughs> but it was very dangerous to, to do. And these women had, had many uh, uh, oppositions. I really think that they, some young women pointed out that they were like the battered women of today. And, and it's very true. They, they were beaten. They were robbed of the, the, the banks, uh, the uh, uh, checks from their jobs were taken over in the bars. When my father was elected mayor of Minot, the first thing he did was make it a, a, uh, unlawful to, to cash the checks of a working man in the bar because the women would be waiting outside of the saloon to get, you know, to get money to feed the children. So. These matriarchs in my family, I think for five generations, they're generations of matriarchs who raised, many of them raised their own children because the life of men in the, in the frontier was even, even less than it is today. And widows were left with their children. And my mother in 1919 chained herself to the gates of the White House for the vote. Uh, so uh, now I have uh, grandchildren who are all militant women, and if my great-grandchildren are not militant, they'll be sorry. <laughs> but I, I want to bring primarily the basis and root of my life is the sense of being with the struggles of the people. I think in my family, five generations have been with a radical struggle. This, this not, didn't always mean far to the left. Uh, it meant many k kinds of things, like um, the Women's Christian Temperance Union was a radical organization that my grandmother belonged to. And they were ab abolitionists. And, and I don't think that's unusual in the Middle West to have four or five generations of radicals in a family. I don't know whether they drowned the Republicans or what. <laughs> but this is a, a, something we must bring back. The, 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 the university has made us feel that our people are, are stupid. There was a whole generation where it was taught, uh, the Southern agrarians, all these elitist writers, they, had, they made a great injury upon our, our young people. Robert Penn Warren, Tate, these people were just like taking a, a dose of poison every morning when you went to their classes. A poison of elitism, of existentialism, of... Uh, 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 well, it turned out that they supported the Marshall Plan, they supported the, the, the whole uh, McCarthy. If they weren't paid, they should have been St stool pigeons of that, intellectual stool pigeons, I would call them. So this, this is a uh, very deep struggle to, to, do, to penetrate and see th this, this, this conspiracy of silence, of poison, not only to the rivers and the land, but to our minds and our hearts. 
let us all return. It is the people who give birth to us, to all culture, who by their labors and create all material and spiritual values. No art can develop until it penetrates deeply into the life of the people. The source of American culture lies in the historic movement of our people, and the artist must become voice, messenger, awakener, sparking the inflammable silence, return really to the people, partisan and alive, with warmth and abundance, excess, confidence without reservation, or cold and merely reasonable bread, or craftiness, writing one thing, believing another, the superior person, even superior in theoretic knowledge, an ideological giant, but bereft of heart and humility. Capitalism is a world of ruins, really. Junk piles of machines, men, women, balls of dust, floods, erosions, masks to cover rapacity, and in this sling and wound, the people carry their young. In the shades of their grief, in the shadow of their hunger, hope and crops in their hands, in the dark of the machine, only they have the future in them. Only they. Let us seek each other in the villages of the earth, in the rip dark where we live in the dust. Find us singing in the underground vein, the germinal seed in the returning sun, and bring our goodness to enormous, fertile, and perpetual harvest toward zealous of noon, toward total expansions of crops, of brotherhood and sisterhood. Let us await each other in the field, in the new year, risen in ancestral dust from the furrow, from the womb of the people, where in its lamentations we have loomed our life, where the leaves forgive the root, and our children rise in perpetual sunrise, in immense globular light, we await each other. The light returns on no enemy faces, but upon the communal chorus, roused in villages of the earth to cry, salute, and sing, and shout in choruses of millions, rising toward communications, towards extremities of natives, of total expansion, in the entire solar light, on all flesh, on all fields, and all villages, rouse us from sleep, Rouse us, let us seek each other, and move from the violent, the broken, the predatory, to the enormous and myriad fertile and impregnated harvest, the global earth. I seek and find you in the root dark, in the underground veins, support of all leaves and summer forgiven. Quietly between us, the people have made the corn from windy grass in solid and bursting sun upon a sob stable cob. Amidst lamentations, wounds, separations, and lesions, continuously and massively bruised under the hooves of conquerors, we have loomed our lives. And the same passion as high corn for the velocity of pollen spreading to all days. As an ally, let us stand together in solidarity. I am seeking you amongst the ancient stone, in the dusty faces, in the raised fist, in the resurrected heart. What strikes you, my sisters, strikes us all. The global earth is resonant, communicative. Conception is instant solidarity of the child. Simultaneity of the root drives the green sap of the flower. In the broken, dispossessed, is the holy cry. The only knowledge now is the knowledge of the dispossessed. 
Our earth screams like a bandaged, roaring giant to rise in all its wounds and bear upon the conqueror. We keep our tenderness and the nourishment of the earth green. The heart is central to lava. We burn in each other. We burn and burn and appear as mothers, grandmothers, sisters, warriors. We burn. We are the wine cast struck to the earth, spilled. We are a great granary of seas smashed, burn. We are a garroted flight of doves. We are the face out of labor, out of bone. I saw the women of the earth rising on horizons of nitrogen. I saw the people of the earth coming toward each other with praise and heat, without reservations of space, all shining and alight in solidarity, transforming the wound into bread and children. In a new abundance, a global summer, tall and crying out in song, we arise, we arise in mass meadows, we will run to the living hills with our seed, we will redeem all hostages, we will light the bowl of life, we will light singing across all seas, the resonance of the song of the people, lifted green, alive, in the solidarity of communal love, uncovering the illumined fruit, the flying pollen, in the thighs of golden bees, we bring to you our fire. We pledge to you our guerrilla fight against the predators of our country. We come with thunder, lightning in our skin, roaring room singing, our sisters singing, choruses of millions singing. I think since every other session I've seen went over a while, we're just going to go over for a while. <laughs> uh, and in the interest of time, I'm going to ask one quick question while those of you who want to ask questions get to a microphone. So after my one question, um, I'll turn it over to the audience. But I thought I would ask both of you, your work, your writing seems to be so much a part of a life given over to your work and, and other ways. Why did you turn to writing as so much a part of that work? What is, what is it that the writing did for you, and what is it that you wanted the writing to do? Well, men, men could be chairmen, <laughs> but women could only write or, or be secretaries, even in the socialist movement. Is this working? Doesn't sound like it. Can you hear? I think that writing has always been, especially in my time before the First World War, uh, writing even secretly was a, a function of the women could express themselves. Writing and uh, china painting and quilt making, uh, and uh, these, these things were what women could do. But I, I learned all my, uh, got my thing about life sitting under the quilting things of Christian women talking about their lives. Uh, but women were curtailed. In, I couldn't walk down Main Street. I couldn't walk in, you know, into the main. I couldn't have the experiences of, of men. And I think writing, my beginning writing, was it was very largely because that was the only outlet of women to uh, express their anger, <laughs> or their remonstrance, or their uh, rebellion. I think that's really why. I, what other me means did I have at, at 12 years old to, you know, to express my. Uh, uh, Rebellion it was, and I think that was true of many women. The, the history of women is lost diaries and lost records of women whom their husbands tear up and destroy very often, and uh, they hide or burn up themselves. So writing is very interesting in relation to the expression of women. Even today it is. Mr. Hurst? Mr. Hurst, could you comment on this too? Well, I think... Uh, I read uh, Shelley's poem to a Skylark 
you know, hail of the blithe spirit, bird thou never work. I thought, that isn't so hard, you know. <laughs> I ought to be able to do that. And I found out that words are a lot more stubborn than I thought they were. And it took me years, and I read all the books on prosody I could possibly find, from Sir Philip Sidney to Harriet Monroe. And I still didn't learn how to write poetry, and I haven't learned yet. But uh, I started out that way, and I think probably I got my start in the eighth grade when the teacher didn't know what to do with me, so she said, uh, would you mind putting the, our short stories into, the, into a verse form in our literature book? Man, I was delighted. I wrote the most terrible dog word you can imagine, and she praised me for it. And I went home, you know, headed about three sizes too big for my cap. But I guess finally it, I just wrote because, as Sandberg said, a poet has the gift of gab. I apparently had the gift of gab. Uh, I would like to combine a question of poetry and action. Uh, particularly, uh, Mr. Hurst. Uh, Mr. Right Harris, on. could you step down and talk a little more into the mic? How's that? It's better. Does that work? Yeah. Getting better all the time. Can you interpret what he's saying? I particularly there? like to ask Mr. Hurst, uh, having listened to his account of, uh, I would say, the poetic movements of farmers who with high spirit broke all kinds of laws and won quite a bit in the farmers' revolts. Uh, as we know, we're moving into a not too dissimilar period right now. And I would like, very unfairly, to ask both speakers if, if they have the feeling that the, uh, the lifting of the soul, the excitement, uh, of, uh, of uh, once more, uh, with your fellow people in your community, uh, attempting to, whether it's legal or illegal, to correct what everybody knows to be wrong, if some of that spirit is abroad, I'd like you to comment if you have any feeling for it. Some of what spirit is gone? Some of the spirit abroad now. Uh, of what? Of the sin and unhappiness. The sin? Um, you say that some of it is gone? The spirit of dissent? I know the spirit of dissent is there, but it seems to me that both of you combine the uh, lifting of the spirit with the beauty of an excitement of human relations. And uh, I am hoping very much that this will translate itself into the kind of action for the correction of wrongs that we witnessed in the holiday period and other periods to which you referred. And I'm wondering if you sense the same thing. Um, my theory of culture is that culture comes from the oppressed uh, be because in, uh, we see in our time that only the oppressed can be humanists. And I think whenever you have a period like now, you're going to have an uprising of, cu of, of culture of the oppressed, which you had now in the, in the Indian movement, in the black movement, in the women's movement. New images are coming up in their poets. And I think that this terrible time that we're in, it seems to me that the dissent and the creative power of uh, the people who, of the oppressed is becoming uh, the only culture we have. Capitalist culture is, is uh, I, they, they are now having to give out big grants to poets because they need somebody so badly to put perfume on the sewer that, that they're having to buy poets to do it for them. I uh, never saw capital, capitalism pay so much to poets uh, before. And I, but I think that I feel very strong the women's movement, for example, now is bringing up uh, images that were buried in me or that my grandmother had a wonderful new kind of culture, or, or an, uh, not new, I wouldn't say, but a revealment, a visibility of a buried culture that is always buried in the oppressed. But I think that this, this image making, this poetry always, I saw it in the, in the 30s, 
You see, it wherever you have an uprising of oppressed people, you have a release of this creative uh, potential that is in them. Mr. Hurst, as a farmer, could you comment perhaps on what you're seeing? Well, I'm not sure that uh, poetry translates into action. I wish I were, but I'm not sure that it does. I sometimes take, it takes more than that to bring people into a kind of organized action of rebellion or radicalism or dissent. An occasional voice here and there rises out of the midst the people that are in trouble, but until there is a sufficient pressure on them and the tension becomes unbearable, I think they tend not to rise against their, the oppression. And I wish that there were more action that would be generated by words than there is. Uh, well, for one thing, we live in a kind of a, a height of sensation. Uh, you look at the morning paper every morning and the black headlines there are are uh, always an emotionally, uh, tend to, uh, to arouse you emotionally. They're not really thoughtful headlines, unless the Christian Science Monitor accepted. But, uh, and the next day, they may contradict themselves. So that we live, we've lived almost entirely in a, in a, in a high, high state of emotion. Let's say since, uh, oh, since the Russian Revolution, I think, We've been, uh, we've been fighting Russia now for almost 40 years, and uh, it's been a great, great ploy for our politicians to, any time they need to, to, to uh, raise the budget, to uh, start up a uh, campaign against Russia. And uh, we're still doing it. And I don't know how long we're gonna keep on doing it, using it as a political ploy. But we've gotten a little tired of, uh, of, uh, being, um, of hearing the cry of wolf, wolf, and I'm not sure that even a good poet, I mean a great poet, could come along and rouse people to action as they could maybe 50 years ago. A time has come and we've, our ears are a little dull. We don't listen as well as we did to things like that. We've heard too much already. You think, Mr. Sewer, that's true? Well, I, I think of it a little bit differently than, than you place it. I, I think of action the word coming from action, action imposing upon the, the, the word imposing upon action is always a, a decadent thing. I'm talking about not the individual poet,